People of God, the Holy Gospel for you according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the gospel, the good news of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God the Father, from Jesus Christ the Son, and from the Holy Spirit, let the people of God say, Amen. So this greeting I just gave you is called a Trinitarian greeting because it refers to God as a God in three persons, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or a bit more inclusive, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. The latter emphasizing what these three persons do, what their, their function is within the one Godhead. Today is Holy Trinity Sunday, when the church celebrates this triune God. And you know, it's one of those Sundays when pastors love to take off, because <laughs> the Trinity is complicated and it's so hard to talk about it. But I wasn't lucky enough to have a day off today, so <laughs> we have to talk about it. And while the doctrine of the Trinity remains one of the basic teachings of Christian theology, it is also one of the least understood dogmas. So we do have a lot of unpacking to do this morning. Today is also, as it happens, Reconciling in Christ Sunday, or RIC Sunday, when we here at Christ the King Lutheran Church celebrate our diversity and say again that here all are welcome no exceptions, and that this includes our siblings in the LGBTQ plus community, as well as people of different, different racial backgrounds, ethnicities, languages, and cultures, and people with physical and mental disabilities, and so on. So since I was scheduled to preach today early in the week, I was scratching my he head. Wondering how was I going to connect, how was I going to bring, go from this doctrine of the Holy Trinity to our emphasis on full inclusion of all people, how, how was I going to connect those two celebrations today? But I have to tell you, as I was digging into the text for this week and doing my research for this sermon, it occurred to me that the Trinity in itself, the Trinity in itself is a picture of unity and diversity. Three distinct persons, yet one God. Unity in diversity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The church I grew up in was and still is a Roman Catholic church. St. Michael's in German, St. Michael in Lauterbach, a small village in the southern Black Forest. That church and that town were first mentioned in a written document in the year 1101, 1101. So it's almost a thousand years old now. The current church was built in the late 19th century in an elaborate neo-baroque style, or so Wikipedia says. Here's a grainy old picture that I have showing St. Michael says it sits in the middle of our village by the way, that house in the foreground that you see there, that's where I spent the first 15 years of my life until we moved away. That's the house I grew up in. As a small boy, I remember standing in the balcony of St. Michael's. Yes, I sang in the choir for a while with very mediocre results, I have to tell you. <laughs> and staring in awe at the many frescoes and paintings and statues of saints that covered pretty much every inch of the ceiling, the walls, even the mighty pillars. This is the only photo I could find of the church interior, the, the way it looked when I was a child. You, you can see, you get an impression of how opulent, right, and how richly appointed this sanctuary was. 
I say was because in the 1960s, when I was 10 or 12, I think, there was a major renovation of the inside of the church. They painted over all the artwork, took out many of the statues, dismantled the high altar that was made of precious wood covered in gold leaf. The walls of St. Michael's ended up being painted a stark white. No pictures, no frescoes, no statues. I remember one of the older parishioners saying at the time, they made it look like a Protestant church. <laughs> and she said, Protestant, like it was a dirty word. <laughs> well, it was the 60s. We did lots of crazy things in the 60s. Now, my most favorite painting before those barbaric renovations was the one on the curved ceiling right above the high altar in the very center of the space that dominated the entire church. And when you stood on the balcony in the back, as we did in that choir, right, it was right there, like dead ahead, filling your entire field of vision. It's a little hard to see in this photo. It's the, the only photo I have, and the top is kind of cut off. But I hope you get an impression of how prominent this particular fresco was. There was God, the Father, flowing white beard and gold embroidered robe and all sitting on his throne. There was Jesus, the Son, sitting at his right hand with a globe in his hand to symbolize his reign over all the earth. And then there was the Holy Spirit on the other side, pictured as a dove, the Holy Trinity, one God in three persons, one for three and three for one, full of mystery, full of unknown power. For years, this, this picture from the late 19th century determined my image of God, the, the way I thought about God as a kind of an imperial emperor, right, on a throne who showed up as three, sitting on three golden thrones up there in the clouds. For most of my childhood and into my youth, that's the picture I had of God. And because I was raised Catholic, I knew deep down in my soul that this was a vengeful God, full of wrath, of whom I should be afraid because he could send me to hell. It's a picture of God that has been prevalent in the Christian church since the fourth century when the doctrine of the Trinity was first formulated as, as a way to explain people's experience of God at that point. It's an image that resonates with us into this very day. What I didn't know as a kid, and still wonder about as an adult, is that this picture of a triune God is just that, a picture. It's a metaphor, if you will. It's a very limited and ultimately frustrating way of explaining who and what God is. And if there's ever been anything that can be fully explained... It's God, because you know, God is this big, right? God is this big, and, and what we know of God is about this much. In seminary, they want us to try and not to try and use an analogy to explain the Trinity. You know, as in God is like a three-leafed clover leaf, a shamrock that shows the three persons in one plant. Or God is like a family relative who can be a father and an uncle and a nephew to different people, depending on which of the relatives he is relating to. All of those analogies fall short, we were taught, and ultimately don't explain God sufficiently because the truth is that God cannot be explained. God is God and goes far beyond any human comprehension. But you know what? The Holy Trinity, this image of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's an analogy too. And in the end, falls as short as all the others in explaining what can't be explained. Now, the very word Trinity never shows up in the Bible. And Jesus never mentions the Trinity either, although he comes close. He says many, many times, and many, many things about the Father, and he sure mentions the Spirit several times over and promises that the Father would send the Spirit when the time came. Jesus, in fact, teaches a lot about the Holy Spirit, whom he mentions again in today's Gospel reading. 
When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And he will take what is mine. Remember, all that the Father has is Jesus's, right? So Jesus says, he will take what is mine and give it to you. So clearly, there, there is a unity between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is why the early Christians believed in a triune God, a God of three distinct persons or manifestations, yet one God, which got Christians into trouble throughout Christian history because others, non-Christians, always thought, well, these people believe in three gods, not just one. So if there's anything about this triune God that we can say with any kind of certainty, it is that this three-person God is a relational God, right? One who is in a loving relationship with the other persons of the Trinity. A relational God who manifests God's unity in diversity. Here is how theologian David Lowes puts it. The Trinity he says, has something to say about both the unity and diversity of God's work and manifestation, and about the importance of community to God and all those whom God has created. The importance of community. Well, now we are getting a little closer to the heart of the matter, because the truth is, siblings in Christ, the truth is that you cannot be a Christian by yourself. You can only be a Christian in community. And especially today on this Reconciling in Christ Sunday, we affirm again that as creatures created by a triune relational God who just craves community, we too are meant to live in right relationship with God and with one another. We too are meant to be community together. We are reconciled and reconciling in Christ, claiming the beloved community that Martin Luther King Jr. preached about and that mirrors the very nature of God. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, Dr. King wrote in his famous letter from a Birmingham jail. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. What a beautiful way of talking about community. King's beloved community is one where all people, regardless of race and class and gender and sexuality or physical or mental ability, where all people are woven into one community that is beloved by God and loving towards its members. That is created in the very image, right, of this relational God especially for people who have been long left out. This beloved community demands welcome and affirmation and full inclusion so that in the end, the community itself reflects unity in diversity as God does. That's why our RIC Sunday is a day of affirmation, of celebration, but also of lament. As a society, and dare I say as a church, we are far from living out the ideals of Dr. King. If this past week has shown us anything, it has shown us just how full of hatred our land is. Mass shootings continue unabated while the hearings in Washington lay bare the hate and threat of January 6th. Insurrection! Not unity is our reality. Violence, not relationship, is our reality. Oppression, not inclusion and affirmation, is our reality. That's what we must confront and defiantly proclaim that in this church at least, in this church at least, all are welcome, no exceptions. Would you say that with me? All are welcome, no exceptions. We defiantly proclaim that in this church, at least, we struggle for equity and for affirmation and for love for all of our siblings, 
whatever their color or background, that in this church at least we have found a place where the beloved community may not have arrived yet. It's not a full reality yet, but where the beloved community is becoming a reality, where we are in, on a journey and in a process of moving toward it each time we share God's love with one another and with all those around us. In this church, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of mass shootings, in the midst of baked-in racism and deep division, there is at least one thing that our triune God gives us in spade through God's Holy Spirit. And that thing is hope. Hope, of course, is the theme of our second lesson, the Romans 5 text, that beautiful argument about how our suffering leads to endurance. And endurance produces character, which in turn leads to hope. A hope, as Paul says in Romans, does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You know, we all experience God in different ways. We do meet God as a father, as the creator of all there is, seen and unseen, as the Nicene Creed has it. We meet God as Jesus, the very incarnation of God, teaching us, challenging us, tearing down the walls we like to build between us and those we think of as other. We meet God as the Holy Spirit, that, that guiding force in our lives, that, that life force, that conscience that tells us how to treat our neighbor, that, that, that life force that brings joy and passion into our otherwise dreary lives. And yet... There is one God, and that one God walks with us through thick and thin and accompanies us in whatever suffering and oppression we might experience. That one God brings us hope because that one God loves us so much that even in our suffering, that God is present and manifests through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, through the church, through fellow human beings, through the breathtaking beauty of creation, that God is present in our suffering and in our struggles and able to turn that suffering into endurance and character and ultimately hope. You know this. We need God most when we are down and out. When the world seems to spin out of control, we need God most when we stand at the coffin of a loved one. We need God most when we hear that dreaded diagnosis with the C word in it. We need God most when the darkness closing in, when our world gets smaller and smaller and death closer and closer, and the age-old human questions of who is God and where is God all of a sudden gain new relevance. It is at those times that God invites us to draw close, to reclaim the relationship we have with God, to attend to the relationships we have with one another that, that are an image of God's love, and to once more know in our hearts and our spirits that whatever God looks like, Whatever God is, whatever limited analogies we might devise to explain the mystery of God, God most and foremost is love and grace and mercy. Because this one God in three persons loves us and gives us hope. Hope that sustains, hope that brings purpose and meanings to our lives, hope that will not disappoint. And that, siblings in Christ, is the good news for you this morning. And to that, let the people of God say, Amen. Amen.